Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. He is without question, in my opinion, one of the best in the business and has been in that category for decades. Uh, my old friend Mike DeCourcy. Mike, it is always a pleasure. Thanks so much for your time today. Hi, Steve. How are you? Doing really great. Doing great. Uh, going back to... Uh, how many times have you ever been to Rec Hall? Were you ever? I mean, you know, back yeah, in the days you covered um, Penn State. I, 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 I know for a fact uh, that I was there to cover Pitt versus Penn State in the nineteen ninety two NIT. Yep, Pitt won that game. I, I believe I covered a West Virginia game up there. Yeah, uh, for at least once. And I think I might have been there for wrestling, but I'm not sure about that right. one. That was a little fuzzy. Right. All right. So UConn goes out and just, I mean, takes apart Marquette on Saturday. Everybody is proclaiming, oh, my goodness, they can't be stopped. Then the next game they go to Omaha, and Creighton takes them apart and shot the lights out against them. Does does that in any way indicate to us how difficult it is to win six consecutive games in March? Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. Uh, it, it, it but it also indicates how um, overwhelming, especially in this season, the home court advantage can be. Yeah. It, it seems to to really make a difference in teams this year more than ever. I, I was when the NCAA men's basketball selection committee announced their their. Uh, their bracket, their their mock bracket, I guess you'd call it, bracket projection, whatever you want to call it, uh, on Saturday mm-hmm. with the top four seats in each region, I had 14 of the 16, and I was off by one spot on the 15th. I, I, I had basically Wisconsin as the first five instead of the last four. Mm-hmm. and But I was off by two lines on San Diego State because what San Diego State has done is beat all the good teams in the Mountain West that are all pretty good. At home, and they go on the road and they lose, and it happened again last night. There has been basic against the better teams in that league. There has been almost no, uh, there has been almost no interruption to that pattern with with San Diego State, and yet they still put them as a pretty solid four seed, which really surprised me because that's who they are. And I know there are a lot of teams on that list. I'll be honest, I know there are a lot of teams on that list that fit that description. Uh, Iowa State's kind of a little bit like that. Baylor's kind of a little bit like that. Uh, but uh, but they're they're like that in a better league. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. It's not, you know the the Mountain West is a very fine league, but it's not the Big Ten or the Big Twelve or the Big East or the SEC. It's interesting because I think I saw something that in the last four years, ranked teams on the road won sixty eight percent of the time. I think that was it. But this year, the winning percentage for ranked teams is forty four percent on the road. Which I found to be fascinating, but also matches up with what I've watched. Does that match up with right. what you've watched? Absolutely. Uh, that's that's everything that we've seen this year. And and what that says is, first of all, the the lesser teams are not as lesser as they used to be, for lack of a better piece of grammar. And the better teams <laughs> are are not the powers that they used to be. Uh, we and I, I think there are a couple of reasons for that. One is a bit of homogenization because of the transfer portal has stretched the talent out to more places. And also, I, I think the, this is not an, a very impressive freshman class generally. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it lacks greatness. And mm-hmm. secondarily, it's harder now for a freshman to make an impact. It will be at least until next through next season because of the COVID year, where you literally have 18-year-olds playing against 25-year-olds. So it's always been hard to make the transition from playing high school ball to playing college. But that leap is much greater now and, and has been for the last three, four years than it's ever been and, ever, and probably ever will, hopefully ever will be again. Not everybody can make the transition up. I mean, we've seen that. I mean, like I see that all the time. Like guys make the transition up, and you think they can, but then they can't. But then there's Dalton Connect. I think I want to say Northern Colorado right? goes to yeah. Tennessee, and he has been terrific. There, where the point where he's going to be an NBA pick, it looks like. 
when you watch him play, what has allowed him to make that trans transition from a big sky situation to an SEC situation? Yeah, it's really wild uh, because, like, if this if he had been the best player in the Big Sky, I don't yeah. think any of us would be super surprised that he's an All League level player or all maybe even an All America mm-hmm. level player. Just get granted a better stage and better teammates, and that can uh, empower him to play better against better competition. That wouldn't have been surprising. Mm-hmm. I mean, he had a fine year last year, but he was second team All League. He averaged twenty some points, but it didn't really move the needle on their team. And that's what the surprising part is. Um, Northern Colorado was not very good last year, even with him. And we're saying right. the same thing in the Big Ten with Lance Jones uh, at Purdue uh, and Marcus Damas at Illinois. You'll see tonight Marcus Damas mm-hmm. is terrific. He, he and Lance Jones were teammates at Southern Illinois last year, and they weren't very good. I know, that's the players, crazy. The it's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's nuts. Uh, uh, you talked about freshman classes. All right, so I want to go to a freshman class from a couple of years ago, and that would be Ohio State. When Malachi Brandon came in, I think I think a lot of us thought he'd be really good, but I didn't really think of him initially as a one-and-done guy, which he ended up being. In the end, how much does that affect a coach like Chris Holtman, who's thinking maybe he's going to get a couple of years out of him and only gets one? Yeah, I wrote about this last week, um, and he had two such players. He had one the next year as well. Yeah. I, the the reality is that it ends almost everyone's career, or not everyone's career, everyone's tenure. And yeah. Some of them go on and coach elsewhere, but it, it ends almost. And Rick Barnes is a great example. We just talked about Dalton yeah. Connect. Yep. And he was a, he was at Texas for uh, uh, basically I think fifteen years before mm-hmm. he had Corey Joseph. Uh, go pro on him. Uh, then he had a couple more, and by 2015, he didn't have the, ten- the Texas job anymore. And he didn't get any worse as a coach, but it just totally disrupted. When you when you signed Kevin Durant, he knew like the minute that Kevin finished the the uh, the script on the T on the letter of intent mm-hmm. that 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 Kevin was going to be there for one season, and so he and he could recruit knowing that, and he could sell the next small forward that he wanted. On, don't worry about Kevin. He's not going to be in your way. And watch what he does because we're going to do that with you or some approximation thereof. Mm-hmm. And so he could do that. But when you sign Corey Joseph and he comes out and he averages, I don't know, maybe a dozen points a game on a team that uh, that lost, I think, its second round NCAA tournament game, uh, that just that just wrecks you. And we've seen it happen with uh, with like legitimately terrific coaches who have made Final Fours, like Ben Howland at UCLA, happened with Zach Levine. They did not recover from that. Uh, you look at uh, uh, Tom Crean. It happened at, at Indiana with Noah Vonley. Uh, yep. Did not recover from that. And there are other elements to all of these issues. But that one thing in common, never it, it, it's like almost insurmountable. And the only ones who have, in, have surmounted it are guys who either had already had national championships or were in the Hall of Fame, usually both. Uh, Jim Beheim managed it uh, to an extent, although I think the program was diminished. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, Mike Krzyzewski could get over that, and he did. Uh, and, and, of course, uh, John Calipari, uh, they, they, they had it happen to them in 2013. And 2014 and 15, they made the Final Four. So uh, they, 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 there are places where there are people that can survive it. But generally, uh, it's impossible. And, it, you know, my, my friend Mike Hopkins out at Washington, um, yeah. Really good guy, and I think it started out great, but then he signed two guys uh, that that fit this description, and and the program has not recovered. And I, right. you know, I hope the best for him, but uh, it's just it's the program has never recovered from su- signing uh, Isaiah Stewart. Uh, it just it, 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 the guys who played for him more, you know, they had okay years, but yeah. it's just it's too much. It, it, you, if you can't replace them quickly enough. Uh, you never recover. John Calipari's in that interesting spot at Kentucky. He's got a lot of young talent on that team, but they have not. They have been a mixed bag of winning, and they even lost. I think what three straight games at Rupp Arena, which, as you and I know, is totally unacceptable down there. Uh, right. So where 
it, where is that program right now, in your opinion? Because it's still really terrific, but... <laughs> oh, the, the but yeah, is that, yes, right? uh, the question, yeah, yes. Yes, uh, uh, okay. my apologies, no, I mean, Poor, poorly phrased. No, 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 it's fine. I was wait. I just didn't want to yeah. step on you there. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 there are people who are dissatisfied, Steve, and I don't have any patience for that at all. I really don't. Uh, it's the same as, you know, my lack of patience for Steelers fans who who want to move on from Mike Tomlin. Well, uh, yeah. It, it, look, it, it's, it's just not how – I just don't believe that's how sports works. Like, if you have a great coach, and, and some of the results don't meet up to his standards or the program standards, does that mean he's still not a great coach? Do I think that John Calipari got dumb in the last three years or four years? No. No, I don't. Uh, do I think that they're still bringing in really good players? They are. Um, I just it, it's it's a it's a difficult space to navigate. Uh, if you get the right guys now, you still can have great success, but it's not as easy to figure out where to get them, and it may not be as sustainable as it once was. I think we're going to see more ebbs and flows in college sports, especially college basketball. Uh, because it's it's so easy with 300 some schools it's so easy to go from being the seventh guy on a on a good team or a great team and go be the first guy on a mid-major team where you get to play all the time and score a lot of points maybe make the tournament uh, i it's it, so it's harder to to sustain greatness than it used to be yeah. purdue is a team we know what their ncaa tournament has looked like under matt painter you look at this team here, and I know it's going to depend on bracket, matchups. I understand all of that. How much pressure is on them to actually get to the Final Four because of not just this team but history? Oh, there's a lot. Uh, I, I wonder, like, because of what the recent history is, I wonder if the greatest pressure isn't just to get to the Sweet 16. Because they, they, not, not very many of the guys who are on the 2022 team are on, are on this team. I think there are a few Mason Gillis, one or two others, right. um, but they, they just they, they don't have uh, great experience at any level of the tournament. And, and I don't think Zach Heady came back to have guys hang on him for thirty games <laughs> to, to lose short of the Final Four. Mm-hmm. But I, I mean, Saturday, Sunday's experience showed us again that that if they want to get to where they want to go. They've got to have some guys make some some jump shots. No doubt, it, it, it didn't happen on Sunday. There have been other circumstances when it didn't happen. Uh, the worst part of it is, I think, the worst part of it is that you have guys that won't take them, and that's right. where the real problem starts to crop up for for Purdue is guys kind of running away from shots or declining open shots. Uh, they they just can't have that. They, that that team needs space. If they have space, Edie becomes almost unguardable. But if they have no space because guys either uh, don't shoot uh, open shots or uh, can't seem to connect on open shots when they're even though their numbers say they should make most of them or or nearly half, I guess it should, I should say, um, that's when they will run into a problem. And I, I saw that on Sunday. Uh, Ethan Morton wide open shot. Mm-hmm. Um, and that with with Edie being triple teamed, wide open, top of the key, right? it's just the, the kind of shot just about every college guard should be able to make. And he passed it up. And if you're out there for defense and you're passing up that shot, man, you better be like Michael Cooper cir- circa 1986. Yeah, because like nobody's that good defensively right. that they can that they can deaden the offense by passing up a shot like that. See, and this you brought up Lance Jones. See, to me, in watching them not just on TV but watching them in person, I feel like his athleticism is that different little element that they haven't had with the team, and that's why I'm anxious to see what he does to open up the floor for Edie and others. Yeah, he's been great, especially post Chris post Christmas uh, as we restarted the Big Ten season. His numbers are phenomenal. Uh, he's had like one bad game. Uh, he's he's shooting close to 40% on threes. You look at his season number, and it's not overwhelming, but as the competition has gotten better and has 
but more so as he's gotten more comfortable. He's shooting high 30s, uh, 38, 39. And, and that they can win with that, but they can't just have him doing that. They need others to do that as well. And, and that, that, you know, uh, Braden Smith has been a tremendous point guard. Yes. Um, but he can't, you can't ask him to make shots every game because teams are going to guard him harder. Uh, the guys who are wings and, and, and stretch four like Mason is, those guys got to make shots when, when teams are jamming the lane, and they did not do that on Sunday. Right. And see, with Smith, if Smith goes right, his passing is tremendous. But if he goes left, see, that's where you got to turn him. Then it's, it's right. good but not great. Uh, I, one last question. That's going to be about Houston. Uh, Kelvin and his staff have they they there's a change in conference. It's a whole new set of opponents on a night in and night out basis. Shed the point guard is is really one of those coaches on the floor kind of point guards, in my opinion. I don't know if you have he a is. different opinion. Oh, and, I love it. and what kind of job have they done considering the change to the Big Twelve? Yeah, I think it, it it's been great. They 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 defend so well. Uh, they are so, and it's not just a change to the Big Twelve, but also the player personnel losses that they had after after last year. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, they lost uh, Jarris Walker to the NBA draft. A guy, you know, one of those guys that they they knew was going to be a one year guy. So mm-hmm. it doesn't hurt you when you know that. But they still had to replace him, and they don't have super dynamic wing scoring. Or uh, or post scoring, and I think that's where their their issue will develop at some point in the tournament. And I, for me, when you're a team like them, your your whole deal is to try to delay the discovery of your flaw until no as late as possible. Yep. Uh, and that may be in the final four, it may be in the championship game, and maybe it, by some miracle, nobody ever figures it out. Uh, that's <laughs> but but. They're 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 right now they are their number one and number two options basically are small guards. Shed is around six one, LJ Cryer is around six one. That's not a recipe for winning at all, but no one's you know, no one can say you can't get to the final four playing like that. Yeah. Because that's what I was talking to somebody about yesterday and they asked about Illinois and I said, Look, they've got a, something that's interesting. This is a conference where you need big scoring wings. I mean, this conference, you really have to have that. Like, Seth Lundy was like that last year. I said, Illinois right. got that. You know, you need, in this conference, big you know, scoring wings, like 6'5 to 6'8 scoring wings. I mean, that's that's how I've, I've viewed the Big Ten. Yeah, they fit the description of Houston in a totally different way. You're right. They, their flaw is they don't have a true point guard. And you're that's not right. winning the NCAA championship without that. So, but totally you, can get to, you can get to Arizona. You can have a lot of fun yep. along the way, and you can hang a banner at the end. Yep. Uh, so you're, you're not going to win the national championship like that. And I can say that. Now they can tell me I'm wrong, and then they can go out and do it. <laughs> but, but history says I'm right uh, because no one has done that. I mean, usually you do it with somebody who's extraordinary at that position, either NBA talent-wise or like Joel Berry, for instance, a, you know, a college four-year guy who is indispensable. But it's usually one or the other. Um, I, I have this. I did this article a few years ago uh, on the Jimmy Black exception. Uh, yes. On the like the very few teams in recent history. So Jimmy Black goes all the way back to 1982. Yeah. So we're talking 40 years now. There were only a handful of teams over those 40 years that didn't have a legit star in one way or another at the point guard position. But there were a few, and that's what I call the Jimmy Black exception. But even Jimmy was a point guard, right. uh, so it's so you. I don't think that Illinois can claim the Jimmy Black exception. They have somebody <laughs> that nominally plays the position, but they don't have somebody that's a true point guard. Mike, you have no idea how much I enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it very much, and look forward to talking again soon. All right, you bet, Steve. Thank you, Mike DeCourcy, Sporting News, Big Ten Network. Yeah, that's a lot of great points to uh, unpack there in talking college basketball with him at the highest level.